um, immediately. immediately. Now, the main aim of our endeavor is to observe and to evaluate the local standard variety of the German language on a long-term basis and to contribute to refining uh, the middle of the Alps um, near to the border of uh, Austria. It's characterized by its um, multilingual and um, nature, Italian and the Italian and German language and culture meet. Um, both languages have an official status and with regard to the Italian country, um, the German speaking population in South Tyrol is a, a minority. However, in South Tyrol, they account for almost 70% of the population. Now, the research on the German standard variety as it is used in South Tyrol is based on the concept of pluricentricity um, of the German language. And according to this concept, different standard varieties um, are being used in the German-speaking area. And among the crucial aspects for considering a variety a standard and not a dialectal variety only, we can mention the official status of the language uh, in a specific area, the school instruction in this language, the existence of own codices, and so on. And so Styral is uh, particularly interesting for linguistic studies, which is due to the to its role as a so-called national semicenter from a pluricentric perspective, which means that there is not a whole country behind uh, this uh, ling linguistic community. And um, its marginal position within uh, the German uh, speaking area and the language contact situation between German and uh, Italian. Now, in 2016, the entirely revised edition, second edition of the Variantenwörterbuch was published 12 years after the first edition from the year 2004. But for this new edition, it was not possible to analyze the South Tyrolean German variety to the same extent as um, the varieties of the so-called full centers um, and recent developments are less uh, represented in, uh, in the dictionary. Now, um, what are the challenges for the lexicographic treatment of the standard German in South Tyrol? We can identify a series of problems on different levels, and I will mention some of them as examples. The first example concerns the databases. So uh, lexicography uses more and more standard texts from newspaper corpora as databases, and so did the Variantenwörterbuch. However, one uh, may wonder whether this text genre is really suited for representing the everyday uh, language usage. For example, bar has a particular meaning in the um, South Tyrolean German. So it means it is a place to have coffee, so a coffee shop, and not a place to have drinks, especially in the evening, in the meaning in the sense of a night bar, like in other varieties of German. Now it is difficult to extract uh, example sentences conveying the meaning of bar from newspaper texts. Their bar is often mentioned, for example, together with break-ins, but it's hardly described um, in a way to infer its different uh, usage. For instance, uh, mentioning what people usually do in a coffee shop, like drinking a coffee, eating a croissant, reading uh, the newspaper, and so on. Many relevant linguistic phenomena can be monitored not only with uh, newspaper corpora, but additionally, and sometimes even better, with other text genres and with wet corpora and corpora of computer-mediated communication. Now, uh, another challenge is concerned, uh, concerns the item classes. Um, so we can see that as far as the Variantenwörterbuch is concerned, there is a strong focus on the description 
of the occurrence of particular words in different regions of the German-speaking area. Um, now, there are lemmas with particular occurrences and special meanings, Sonderbedeutungen in one and more regions. But what do we know about their collocability? I would like to illustrate the issue using the word, the lemma, uh, mobility, as an example. The general meaning in German is mobility, but in South Tyrol, um, also a special meaning is usual, namely the unemployment of employees after a temporary suspension in the event of a deterioration in the order situation. And this is a transfer from the Italian meaning of mobilità. However, how is this uh, word used? In other words, with which other words does it co-occur? As verbal collocators, we could identify, for instance, jemanden in the mobilität entlassen, to release someone in mobility, or jemanden in die mobilität überstellen, to hand over someone in mobility, sich in mobilität befinden, to be in mobility. There is no clue in the Varianten Wörterbuch on what the usual uh, cortex of uh, lemmas are. Then the third uh, challenge um, I would focus on concerns language change. As we know, uh, language is a dy dynamic system and it varies over time. And this variation concerns all linguistic levels and can be analyzed from different perspectives. We are interested in lexical change and this is closely related to the research on neologism that in our case includes also variants that are common words used in the standard German but not, that are not yet lexicalized. We are aware that these are not neologisms in the narrow sense, but with regard to data processing, we don't have to make a distinction. I will show you an example of a word with a particular meaning in such style that is not lect, uh, yet lexicalized. This is the word skonto. Um, skonto generally means a discount paying in cash, when paying in cash. However, in Sastyrol, skonto has a broader meaning, and it refers to every kind of discount independent of the way of payment. In other German regions, in this case, you would use the word rabat. The particular meaning in Sastyrol, again, can be connected to the meaning of the Italian word skonto, which has this broader meaning as well. Another example... Um, that I will show you is, uh, concerns the word form and consequently the word meaning that have not been lexicalized yet. It means that it's not a lemma in the Varianten Wörterbuch. The, um, it's the word vollkorn pizzetta. The particular part of this compound word is pizzetta. That derives from pizza being etta, <laughs> the diminutive suffix in Italian. But not the whole word is a loan word from Italian. The compound modifier Volkorn, whole grain, is a German word, and it is not used in the, uh, use the Italian word integrale. However, it, it would not be the same talking about a kleine Volkorn pizza, which means a, a small pizza, a mini pizza, as pizzetta in Italian refers to a particular type of pizza, um, that is usually a very small pizza that you offer, for instance, at a buffet at, uh, as finger food. And it has exactly this form. This is a prototype of this Italian pizzetta. And the last uh, example um, that I will show you is, uh, concerns the word autonomy. And um, in South Tyrol, Autonomy and the word field around it is frequently used in political discussions, in newspapers, etc., as it is politically, a politically constant hot topic, particularly since the conclusion of the so-called uh, Second Autonomy Statute in 1972. Um, 
in the South Tyrolean context being uh, a, the political autonomy perceived as a very important achievement after the annexion to uh, Italy, above all for the uh, German-speaking population. Thus also a variety of compounds have been established. Now one concept in the con uh, context of the discussion regarding autonomy is full autonomy, full autonomy, which to our knowledge has never been in discussion for the inclusion in uh, the Variantenwörterbuch. Um, it indicates a movement calling for a full autonomy for South Tyrol remaining at the same time part of Italian state and being in this specific meaning a particular particularity of the South Tyrolean context. But what could be um, opportunities for the lexicography treatment of the standard German used in South Tyrol? The one-click dictionary allows pre-generating um, dictionaries automatically for, from a corpus using sketch engine and the post-editing using the lexonomy lexon dictionary writing system. Let's have a look on how it works. The one-click dictionary is a convenient automation for exchanging lexicographic data between a sketch engine corpus and a lexonomy dictionary and will eventually cover, for example, the extraction of example sentences, the detection of definitions, the, um, the clustering of word senses, and so on. A user's interaction is initially with Sketch Engine. Once the user pushes the button, Sketch Engine starts computations, and analysis are carried out. The results are transmitted to Lexonomy as dictionary entries. And once the dictionary entry, the dictionary has been created in uh, lexonomy, the user can edit or refine the dictionary. This is also like Sketch Engine done on the web. Possibilities for post-editing are, for example, features for splitting or lumping senses um, and for distributing example sentences to meanings and so on. Finally, the dictionary can be published as an online dictionary, ideally under an open source license. Now, uh, Lexonomy's design provides access to the internal data of dictionaries and standardizes the, in the interaction with it. This brings about the possibility to design own applications that rely on Lexonomy without much risk of a possible vendor lock-in. But note that an extern external application can manage its own private data. Additionally, there exists another possibility. This de de the development of a user application could also become part of Lexonomy. It is an open source project with a growing community embedded in an ongoing European infrastructure project, which is Alexis. The users already include the University of Ljubljana, the Dutch Language Institute, and Eurek Research, that is ourselves. Now I would like to show you by means of a concrete example how the one-click dictionary module can be used. For this purpose, I will use BAR that I've introduced before. Now this image shows the environment of lexonomy where you can elaborate your dictionary. I will present some steps how to produce a very simple and rudimentary entry. Here you can see the first step. This is creating the head word. To work further on the entry, you can activate a selection menu for instance, to insert definitions, example sentences, collocations, and so on. In our example, we want to select an example sentence. And as you can see, example sentences are extracted automatically, and we have to select one of them. In this case, we use our corpus that contains text crawled from German South Tyrolean websites 
using selected URLs as a starting point. Now a good example should be illustrative concerning a typical situation in a bar and furthermore it should also be distinctive with regard to the general German meaning of the word which is night bar. Now the selected example tells us that in the bar of a hotel also external guests are welcome and can enjoy delicious cakes and coffee. And for sure you wouldn't go to the night bar for having a good cake. Now the last um, image shows us what a final entry could look like. And in this case, we only have the lemma, the definition, and the example. Now let me come to a conclusion. So what are the, the needs? There is the need of appropriate corpora to observe language use, including everyday situations and to detect trends of the local standard variety of the German language. There's also a need of support for um, automatically extracting relevant data for variety lexicography, for instance, collocations, new word forms and meanings. And there's also the need of easy to use tools, which, mean, which means tools that also um, people not being computational linguists can easily use. And, what should, and why should we participate in networks such as Alexis? It offers possibilities to take special local factors into account and strengthen the position of local dialects or standard varieties. It gives us access to current methods, tools, but also makes us aware of challenges and upcoming solutions for the next generation of online dictionaries. It allows us to integrate local digital resources from projects such as our Corpus Südtirol, our um, Learner Corpus intra Infrastructure into modern workflows and to test them together. And Lastly, it, we can also influence the design and design decisions for new tools and workflows. And overall, integrating linguistic ideas into technical consideration from the start always beats add on post hoc solutions for accommodate for unforeseeable situations. That's all for now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation and perfect timing. Uh, time for questions. I'll ask one myself. Uh, when you select the example sentences, do you ever edit them before adding them to the dictionary? For, for clarity. The moment this is... We don't create the dictionary at the moment, but we try to elaborate a concept for future new editions um, of the so-called Variantenwörterbuch. Uh, so we are not in the situation to deal with uh, example sentences. So no, we don't edit them, uh, but for the moment we select them for this prototype project, let's say. Okay, but uh, does your system or your idea foresee the possibility of editing them? Or is it, is it purely authentic sentences or should they be purely authentic or should they be uh, the result of uh, the lexicographer's uh, knowing work on the sentence to make it more representative? Well, the idea is uh, to select those sentences that are suitable uh, but authentic, I would say. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I have a question about uh, how do you s s select the websites that you crawl? Is it, and uh, does it include social media? So we have uh, a list of URLs from um, 
These, concern, these are um, online newspapers, blogs, um, official websites, touristic websites, and so on. So that means that uh, the st stylistic variation is, is huge, right? So do you have any metadata uh, regarding the style or, or the genre of the website text? If you have some? Uh, uh, metadata uh, that, that reflects the style. Yes, uh, we have some metadata about the name of the medium, the date uh, when it has, uh, produ has been produced, and the author if, if, it's a, if this metadata is available, and yeah. Any more questions? Uh, how do you dis distinguish between the variety that you are interested in and possible influence from the larger German-speaking communities that you are located close to? So in, in the corpus we created, we are, our starting points are URLs from uh, local newspapers. Of course, we can't exclude that there is some text produced by someone from Austria or Germany or Switzerland, um, but usually they are produced by um, South Tyrolean speakers. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? If not, then let's thank Andrea again. <laughs> and we now have about two minutes for room change, if needed.
Uh, the next to speak is Milos Jakubicek, uh, who will be talking about uh, Tagalog English Korean Dictionary. Uh, here you are. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you see, there is a long list of authors uh, on the main slide. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about something that keeps all of us and kept all of us um, quite busy and uh, is a work of many, actually. Um, and there should be perhaps additional 15 people listed um, to this list, but let's make it short. Um, two years ago, uh, at ELEX 2017, um, we were presenting the one click dictionary that Andrea, where are you? I don't know, uh, was talking about just um, before me. Um, and the idea behind was that we were involved with all parts of um, the automation of dictionary production in terms of you know, adding examples to a dictionary, adding synonyms, um, drafting new entries, finding neologisms, and so on. And at some point, we just wanted to try to put all the bits and pieces together. And um, that's where basically the one click dictionary or originated as a sort of playground for finding out um, what shall we do next in order to improve, basically. Uh, but the one-click dictionary was a tool, not a particular dictionary project, right? Um, and it, you know, it's a tool that is far from being perfect and um, needs to be further developed and so on and so on. Um, but for a long time we were actually looking for, for a particular dictionary project where we could try to do that, not really in a one-click dictionary fashion, um, but uh, in a fashion where we could actually test how far we can go with the whole automation, um, what are the missing bits, um, how does the whole automation change the dictionary development, um, how does it influence the post-editing. Uh, we tried to coin the post-editing in terms of, uh, you know, what, how does it change the work of the lexicographers. And um, I've been now presenting one project uh, where we finally got a chance to test it, right? So um, this is not using the one-click dictionary uh, as such. Um, it's rather something like one million click dictionary. Uh, <clears throat> many tools around, but the underlying idea is really to draft as many parts of the entries as possible automatically, and then involve people for the post-editing and, you know, see where this all actually fits together. So we have some data, um, tools that work with the data and people, and at the end um, there is an actual dictionary. Um, that dictionary is a bilingual dictionary um, from Tagalog to English and Korean. Um, it's entirely from scratch. There is nothing that we would, uh, we would base this dictionary on. Uh, we started with automatically generating a draft of the whole entries. <clears throat> and then um, the dictionary was partially post-edited. When I say partially, what I mean uh, is that the target size of the dictionary is 50,000 entries, and out of those 50,000 entries, only 15,000 are post-edited. The remaining 35,000 are fully automated, right? And, um, you know, this is not just for business reasons, you know, to sort of Obviously, it's the 15,000 most frequent entries, right? I, I guess that, that goes without saying. Um, but this was not just for business reasons, uh, but um, it also allowed us basically to improve on the automatic generation while doing the post-editing so that the final automatic draft uh, is way, way, way better than uh, the initial one. Um, and yet, yeah, the, the scale of that project was, um, or the deadline, um, was initially six and in the end nine months, right? So um, we wanted to sort of try um, and see how much time we actually need for that. Um, it's more than we originally envisaged, um, but I still think that, you know, we have run quite a lot, so the nine months are with some margin. Um, it's a digital-only dictionary, obviously, um, and... Digital only, from my point of view, means that a dictionary is something like a triangle. Um, you have somewhere data. Does that work? Do you see something? Oh, yeah. Uh, you have data um, as a kind of lexical database. Um, 
uh, then some kind of a presentation module, user interface, which could be different on mobile, could be different on desktop, could be different for different users and applications. And then you have um, a search engine, so uh, a program that actually matches the presentation with the data. So a program that chooses the right entries or entry components or multiverse or whatever uh, from the lexical database and presents it to the user in ideally the best way, right? Um, I guess it's quite important from the perspective of how the data is organized. So the, the organization of the lexical database is absolutely unrelated to how the data is then presented to the user. Um, the commercial context of that is work for Neighbor Corporation. Neighbor is the biggest search engine in South Korea. Uh, South Korea is one of the very few countries where Google didn't conquer the whole market. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the dictionary is going to be freely available on Neighbor's dictionary portal, dic.neighbor.com. Soon, trademark. Um, it's something that we can't really influence in terms of, you know, when the data will be processed uh, once we deliver it. Uh, that also means that out of this picture, we are really only responsible for the data part, right? Not for the search engine and presentation part, which on one hand is kind of unfortunate because I would have plenty of ideas how to improve that. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, that's what we have and we are very glad that we actually uh, could work on this project. Besides Tagalog, there, is now, um, there are now subsequent projects on Urdu and Lao um, in the pipeline um, shifted by some, say, three to six months. Um, so what I will be saying here more or less fully applies to two more dictionary projects that are, that are being carried out in, um, in, in pretty much the very same fashion. Um, for us, as we realized, it was really important and why we were, were waiting for, for a deal like this uh, that uh, we can directly sort of manage uh, a small team of editors so that, um, you know, we can adjust the workflow and see how different the work uh, is when suddenly it is not, you know, a standard lexicographic um, editorial workflow from scratch, but this post-editing of something that was automatically drafted, how does it change the whole game? Um, talking about the dictionary, I obviously need to say what's in. So uh, the structure is pretty much standard, I would say. Um, head words, inflected forms, audio pronunciation, word sense division, um, some disambiguating glosses assigned to each sense, collocation synonyms, a picture where available, um, some example sentences and translations, right? So it's, from that perspective, I think a modest project, but, um, you know, um, good to go in terms of trying how the automation works. Um, what's the recipe to get such a dictionary? Well, a big web corpus, or a big corpus, and um, unfortunately that typically means a big web corpus. Um, we've been crawling for some six months, uh, and at the end we got 650 million words, which made us quite happy, despite the fact that, you know, if we would try with a European language during six months, we would be way over six billion words. Um, well, then, during the course of the post-editing, we have identified that 420 million words are machine translated, right? So we were left only with 230 million words, which I think... It's kind of so-so for the size of the corpus and the approaches we have taken. And certainly um, we have so, sort of re-established that the size of the corpus is really important, it's very important, and if we could make the corpus 10 times bigger, for instance, that would really save us a lot of headache, a lot of editorial work, a lot of problems we wouldn't need to face. Um, <coughs> well, you need a poster, grammatizer, sketch grammar, sketch engine, Lexonomy with a bunch of custom editing widgets that some of them I'll be showing. Um, you know, plenty of scri scripts, one to eight developers, um, depending on how fast they want to progress, five to 15 editors, I said minimum five, because I think there should be some um, inter-editing agreement, so not that it is a work of a single person. You cook, don't boil, hope for the best. Um, this is uh, just a small portion of our um, editorial team for Tagalog. As you see, they outweigh the sort of gender imbalance that we keep in lexical computing. Uh, which, sort of, of course, that, I mean, that, that this is me, uh, if, um, if you didn't recognize the haircut, and uh, Marek sitting uh, in the back who was uh, in charge of the um, editorial workflow and team and um, 
was uh, actually largely his work. Um, so how did we go about the whole thing? Um, we started with a corpus and we have basically proceeded in the steps as described here on the screen. Uh, first, we've generated the headwords. Uh, from headwords, we were able to match inflected forms using the lemmatization part of speech tagging. Uh, we were able to uh, record audio pronunciation. Then we proceeded further to word sense induction, uh, built a thesaurus on the sense level, assigned, in, assigned images, examples, and finally the translations. Now, each of the sort of cells that you see there was basically a job that was first automatically drafted and then posted it. The only one that was not automatically drafted at all was the audio pronunciation. Um, in theory, you could do that. <coughs> of course, you can use uh, speech synthesis to, to get the audio um, if you had something like IPA transcription or whatever, but um, you know, practically it just makes no sense because uh, making the recordings is so fast and um, doing post-editing of anything automatically produced is so undoable that you know, this was the single step that we that was basically carried out only manually. Um, the rest always, as I said, first automatic drafting, then post-editing in the order, as you basically see it. The order shows the dependencies between the, the, between the individual tasks. So you know, to be able to carry on with sense level examples, we had to do word sense induction first. Um, the editing tasks were always kind of small, single focus tasks, so no editor was ever dealing with the whole entry. He or she didn't uh, even see uh, the whole entry basically any time. Um, each, of the, each, of the, uh, each of the tasks was first uh, preceded with some kind of you know, introduction training, uh, multi-annotation by several editors where we've observed the inter-annotator agreement. Uh, in the end, each of the tasks boiled down to a some sort of a batch of work in uh, Lexonomy. The batch was assigned to one single particular editor. Um, each batch was basically a standalone dictionary in Lexonomy, so that's quite a different approach than I think uh, is standard. So we, we've got, I don't know, uh, dozens, these days perhaps even hundreds of dictionaries related to the project. Uh, in Lexonomy, and we didn't use the dictionary in, Le in Lexonomy as sort of the center point uh, of, uh, of storing the, the, the results and data, but just, you know, as the sort of editing front end for uh, whatever was the task, and then the results were collected and post-processed. Um, post-processed into a central database in a very simple plain text format that um, Michal Miechura um, has uh, invented for us, and he's definitely going to publish about it in 2020 because it's already on my slide. And, um, you know, he, he, he coined the term as named value, a named value hierarchy, so I call it NVH, and that's it. Um, now, more to the individual parts. I've said corpus, 230 million, uh, 230 million tokens. Uh, we use a modified, say, slightly improved post-process, better to say, version of the Stanford Postager for, uh, for Tagalog. Um, we've uh, got a very simple stemmer that we started with and extended it into... Um, modestly performing grammatizer, I would say, and we have devised a sketch grammar on top of that. Um, the other words uh, were edited using the procedure that you, that you see here. Uh, I'm giving it here merely for the sake of explaining that basically we always try to simplify the post-editing task as much as possible for the editors. Um, ideally, yes, no questions, right? Now, that's, of course... In many cases, it's not possible, but uh, if, for instance, in the case of the head words, this, is sort, this was sort of the, um, this, these were the rules that they had to follow in order to decide what to do with a head word candidate that was generated from, from the corpus using document frequency. Um, the editors, that's something that I should say. So um, we have now 14, Marek, am I right? 14, 14 Tagalog editors. Um, all of them are obviously native speakers. Um, but only, I think, two, three with some linguistic background. The rest are, you know, um, most of them university educated, but working, you know, part-time for us in, in different domains. So we had to, you know, introduce the task, explain what was necessary, um, and we really were strongly motivated to keep it as simple as possible for them. 
Okay, yeah, this is the other half of the uh, this is the other half of the um, of the workflow. Uh, in Lexonomy, this was using the oh well, five minutes. Okay, this was using uh, the the flagging feature so that they went through the list and using keyboard they just sorting out the entries. Inflected forms, easy. People were reassigning lemmas where the lemmatizer got it wrong. There is not a lot to say to it. Pronunciation, um, I think one year or two years ago, you have got this nice, nice booth for Skyping in the office uh, that has equipment so that you can record reliably there. I can, wasn't really cheap, but also, you know, it wasn't very much expensive. I can really recommend having something like that. So, you know, um, people are recording inside. Uh, word senses, um, we have been working on improving the word sense induction that is available in the one click dictionary. And at the moment, we are combining the, uh, say, word sketch, uh, word sketch based approach with, with, with one that is based on word embeddings using models that we've calculated using fast text. So we first, um, you know, um, go to word sketches and then using word embeddings, we cluster concordances from word sketches into a set of clusters where each cluster should ideally represent one sense, right? I guess that, that's, in a nutshell, that's it. Uh, in, a, in the post-editing um, post phase, this is what the editor sees, and um, he or she marks or, or reassigns, <coughs> reassigns the collocations uh, to the right sense, adds a disambiguating gloss, and um, uh, verifies the, the English translation. Um, I mean, so yes, one important thing for the editors was to be able to translate from from Tagalog to English, at least you know initially. Then the then, then the then the English translations were reviewed by English native speakers. Um, pictures um, I should be very careful about that. I was uh, reminded not to mix all the wiki things that I don't really understand what the difference is between them. So we use Wikidata and Dictionary and Wikipedia in this order for searching for pictures, uh, plus Pixabay and Google Custom Search as kind of a fallback. Uh, we had to search in English, so that's one of the things that we found out. None of the search, engine, search engines provides reliable search functions for any other language, basically. So we just machine translated whatever we had to search for into English, search for it, uh, provided the editor with candidate pictures, and the editor was selecting the one that he or she liked. Collocations, um, well, from Sketch Engine, using Sketch Grammar, that's kind of obvious. Uh, the problem that we uh, are still facing or we have faced is that the clustering algorithm that induces the word senses doesn't cluster all the collocations. The algorithm is designed in a way so that, she, so that, it, picks, uh, <coughs> so that it picks the collocations that are sort of most distinctively, distinctively um, inducing the senses. So there might be strong collocations that end up being unclustered, so we had to sort of re-add them into the, uh, into the editing process so that they, at the end, are not missed. That was, I would say, the most difficult thing here. Um, thesaurus from Sketch Engine on sense level after the post-editing of the, of the, of the word senses, so when we had some uh, data that allowed us to do that. Um, examples, codex, um, I guess there is not anything else that I should say to that. We have devised a custom configuration for Tagalog and used the standard functions that are in Sketch Engine as anybody else would. Um, translations, uh, Google Translate plus uh, Microsoft Bing as uh, machine translation um, initial step, thank you, and um, following you know, post-editing by um, translator into English or into Korean. Uh, for Korean, we had Korean translators, of course. Now, lessons learned. Uh, biggest issues were not in technology, but in our, particularly my poor human resource and data management, uh, my human resource and others' data management. Um, and there, I think we have really learned a lot. Uh, technologies are definitely mature enough to be beneficial. So that, that is sort of, I think, the positive message here. Uh, we, are, we, we can, um, so, so the automation can be helpful uh, to sort of make the whole thing faster, cheaper, and hopefully also better. Um, a good and big corpus is the best start for everything. Um, and we have been getting back to it over and over again during the project, and I just can't emphasize that enough. The bigger, the better, the, better, the bigger and better, uh, the easiest the rest then will be. Conclusions. Um, almost all of the steps can be efficiently automated, as I said, except for the pronunciation. Uh, where it doesn't pay off. 
Um, the Tagalog is almost finished and soon to be published at Neighbor website where it should be free and available, Urdu Lao in the pipeline. And yes, I know there is much more information that we should publish about it in terms of the timings, you know, how much time the editor spent on this or on that and what, what is best to do. Uh, and we definitely will, but once we finish also Urdu and Lao, because we've been changing quite a lot of things in terms of what we have learned now after this first language, and we would like to sort of wrap it up then in a single presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. A really impressive project. Uh, any questions? Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. In Japan, we do automated dictionary compilation, but in a totally different way. I'm just very surprised to see all these new things that I haven't seen before. I'm especially interested, if you can elaborate a bit on the, on the word sense induction. It seems to me that that would be maybe the most challenging part of the project. Okay. How does it work and how accurate is it? Yeah, well, okay. So first, uh, that's what we, what we thought as well, that, you know, um, and everybody sort of, I would say, thinks that, you know, word senses, it's a very tough topic. Why? Well, because we mainly don't know what word senses are, right? I mean, <clears throat> I could just remember now, you know, I don't, leave, I don't believe in word senses by Adam Kilgariff. Um, in the end, it, it wasn't such a trouble, actually, and, and um, we found out that, uh, you know, in terms of the, of, of the automation and the post-editing, it was a task that was kind of easygoing for, for the editors, and uh, after a while they felt kind of comfortable with, you know, managing the, the automatic output, and that the automatic output was sort of good, good enough for them um, a start to get a good idea of actually what the senses would be, right? Which for me is kind of the most important thing because, you know, if you draft an entry manually uh, and there the human capacity is really limited in terms of, you know, thinking about all the possible senses or exploitations or whatever we would call them uh, of, of use of the word without having the, uh, without having the context because we just don't have it in our heads. Um, so, you know, in the end it wasn't that problematic. Well, it, the, the examples, for instance, were much more problematic for the people, so we, we, we established that it, it was quite difficult for some of them to sort of deal with the concept of what makes a dictionary, good dictionary example. Uh, as for, uh, as for the, the evaluation, um, I, I, well, I'd love to provide some, but I don't know what to compare to, right? I mean, I don't know how to evaluate this. So, there, you know, I don't trust any gold standard data on words and this, um, you, and you probably can't convince me here. And uh, I can only evaluate in terms of how much post editing was necessary uh, or, you know, or following the, the automatic outputs and that we are going to do together with the other two languages. The, the word sense was actually automatically written other than clustering by, by word sense. Yeah. Was, is there some part of the algorithm that actually writes out a... a a word sense automatically? It, uh, it clusters collocations, and each cluster of collocations should ideally represent a word sense. But it was up to the person to make the disambiguating gloss, right? Uh, and uh, or reassign the clusters as necessary. So the, the sort of key fact for me here is that there is some underlying evidence for the editor to base the thinking on. More questions? I, you m m mentioned in the beginning that you s s sort the words in the corpus by frequency. Uh, did you uh, notice any uh, correlation of the uh, automatic quality uh, when you went from the most frequent to yes. less and less frequent? I mean, yes, definitely yes. I mean, definitely yes. Uh, doing, you know, top 12, top 15,000 is, uh, is certainly easier than it would be doing the next 15,000 having such a small corpus, where the 200 million is really small. I mean, if we had the 2 billion, we could, you know, I mean, fortunately here, I think, uh, you know, we, we do the first 15,000 because uh, 
their corpus wouldn't be big enough for that. So certainly, yes, we ordered by document frequency. I mean, this picture doesn't show one important thing in the whole process that also for us in terms of management turned out to be quite difficult. And that's all the back paths, you know, when, when something you know, doesn't fall through. If, you, if, you, if uh, somebody establishes that this headwater is the wrong part of speech tech, um, so how does that go back into the whole process so that you don't miss anything important? Uh, it was quite difficult. Overall, when I talk about data management, I think the next steps in terms of the automation are actually in improving the data management of these individual small tasks that, that go back and forth between us and the editor and that we need to also follow up on with in terms of, for instance, improving the part of speech triggers or lemmatizers. So that needs to be done in a more efficient way than, than we have done it, I think, so far. Yeah. So certainly, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's way easier. How much did it cost? <laughs> uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> um, that's an honest answer. I don't, I don't know yet. Um, uh, I'm wondering how much I can disclose that, but... Uh, um, I think so. I think the point is definitely if it was way cheaper than if you would just you know let the people draft some 15,000 entries from scratch. And I also believe that the dictionary is certainly better than if we would proceed like that. But uh, I really don't know it because there have been so many parties involved in terms of you know the editors of Tagalog and the Korean translators and so on. That uh, I know I'm in sort of black figures, right? And uh, you know when we. When we were starting with the project, I told my colleagues, I want to go for it, even if, we, if this will be in red, because we need to try this. We need once to try this, right? At least once, because, um, you know, everybody was talking about it. We all wanted to do that. And now we all, I mean, as a community, you know, talking about people like Simon and his talk about it for past five years at least. So I know we are sort of on the safe side here, but I can't give you any numbers now, sorry. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, if, you, if you cannot say any numbers, but at least you could, you could say what external services did you have to pay for? For example, like Google Translator. Oh, that's like a completely marginal figure in the whole cost, right? Not even 1%. I mean, because what Google Translate is designed to translate long text documents, and here you translate what? A few example sentences per entry and the entry itself. I think the whole Google Translate and Microsoft altogether was certainly less than 1,000 euros, less than 500 euros probably, you know. I mean, in, in the overall scale of the project, you can just forget about these costs. Thank you. The discussion is interesting, but we'll have yeah. to continue that elsewhere. Uh, there is one minute of change. Thank you.
this uh, session, Julia Bosquet-Gil will pr present uh, validation of Fontelex Lemon lexicography module with K-Dictionary's multilingual data. Please. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this session. Um, I'm Julia, and Doriel and I, Doriel and I <laughs> will together present how we validated the newly created Fontelex Lemon lexicography module with K-Dictionary's multilingual data. But first, for those of you who are new to linked data, uh, this term refers to a set of best practices to represent, share, and link data on the web. Um, this um, offers new ways of, of um, representing data in a standardized manner. And for this reason, uh, well, all kinds of data. So lexicography has also uh, jumped on the train and lexicographers have started adopting these new kind of techniques and people from academia as well as from companies working with dictionaries have started to adopt this. Um, as I said, it, is, it enhances the way of representing lexicographic data in a standardized manner. And it does so by making it more easily reusable and discoverable as well. <clears throat> so people from academia have started adopting it but people from, diction from the dictionary world in particular, we're talking with about uh, K-dictionaries, they saw in the linked data paradigm uh, an opportunity to facilitate the um, interoperability of their data with external resources. Also looking to, to the multilingual digital single market inside. So, um, Making by by, by, well, by representing this with this new paradigm and linking this to external resources, uh, K dictionaries is also making of their data a, a gold standard for LD compliant lexicographic data that, of course, will make their product their product extensive in the industrial world. So, um, this is the the context in which our work is set, um, but. In order to, when we have a dictionary and we want to represent this dictionary as linked data, we rely on a model. And so far, the de facto model to do so has been the Ontolex Lemon model or its ancestor, the Lemon model. And this has been, well, the preferred choice to represent lexicographic data as linked data. But, um, of course, there is no perfect match between the source data, XML, with our proprietary DTD or other format, TEI, for instance, to the Ontolex format. So, because there is no one-to-one -one match and some, some information in the lexicographic record is difficult to represent in this new, in this new format, um, the Ontolex community have uh, created the lexic of module for lexicography, which will help paving this way in the conversion from one format to the other to represent this lexicographic data um, in a standardized manner in the semantic web context. So the goal with our project is to first validate whether the newly created model um, can be used, as how, how it is used and how well it, it works with an actual use case by applying it across the data in K-dictionaries when the, when the lexicographic record uh, calls for it, and also in the process to introduce some recommendations for future use in case you have a dictionary that you also want to convert to linguistic link data, and it shares some features with KD's dictionary, so you can look at how we did it and take some ideas of how to do it in your effort. Of course, we also want to say to see whether the Ontolex Lemon um, module um, covers those gaps that we detected uh, what well, other people detected and that we also detected in the literature when converting data to lexicographic resources. So let's see whether those gaps are now covered by the new module. So for the data, uh, Doriel will give a brief introduction of what kind of data we're dealing with. So basically the data that was used to validate the lexicog module is the K Dictionaries Global Series, which is a series of uh, multi-layered, detailed, lexicographic data sets in uh, 25 European and Asian languages. It's uh, compiled manually and using advanced uh, corpus-based analysis tools, well, Sketch Engine, for extracting word lists. And um, they're 
maintained and developed in XML within a single uniform framework that is governed by one XML schema that dictates the structure for all of the data sets. Um, so the, there's the, monoling the monolingual core that could use as a basis in itself, and it could also be used um, to develop multilingual uh, data sets by adding equi translation equivalents, and in this way, more than nearly 100 language pairs have been developed so far. Um, this is just an example from the German-Arabic bilingual dictionary that basically represents what kind of information needs to be accounted for when um, applying the lexicog module. So this is an entry to homographs, and the first one has two senses. It has various grammatical information. It has pronunciation information, two senses. Um, obviously, translations to Arabic. Um, some exa usage examples and one compositional phrase. And this is just an example of what kind of information we need to account for when we're converting to lexicon. Exactly. So this, um, this effort, what we have done for, for uh, so this year, this was not the first time that Katie's data was converted to linked data. So in 2015, Klimek and, and Bruma, they already tried to, to well, they already converted the monolingual layer of the K-Dictionary series using the Lemon model. So the, the predecessor of the Antilles, yeah, the predecessor of the Antilles model. But they found some gaps in this model. They found that there was no straightforward way to represent re lexical relations among the different pieces of the, of the lexicographic record and among different dictionary entries. Also, uh, the Lemon model, as well as Ontolex, were devised to lexicalize an ontology, to describe how the concepts in an ontology are expressed in natural language. But here, they were dealing with a dictionary. They had no ontology to describe. They just wanted to convert the dictionary to linguistically in data. So the lack of that ontologi ontological reference was, of course, a doubt that kept arising. And there were some gaps in Lexinfo, which is a, is a, a repository of, of yeah, it's a registry of linguistic categories also used far away and also used uh, widespreadly in the linked data world. So they were, there were some gaps there and new classes and new ad hoc elements had to be created. So part of the, this, part of the problems that Klimak and Bruma detected in 2015 were uh, tackled with, uh, with the new model, with the 2016 model, Antolex Lemon, uh, which provided new classes and relations. So part of those were solved. But we worked with that one, with the 2016 um, model, Antolex, and we tried to convert K dictionaries to, to link data, also the, monoli the, monoli the multilingual aspects, so monolingual and multilingual layers. Um, we did that as part of the linked data lexicography for high-end language technologies <laughs> applications um, project. And we also found some problems there. I'll, I'll um, go into them in a minute. The, the challenging aspect here was that we had a round-tripping condition. That means that uh, K-dictionaries were interested in having, in the linked data version, everything that was in the XML version. So in, those, in a way that we can go back and forth from one dictionary to the, from one format to the other without losing information. Um, that of course meant that some information that was related to the user interface or to just the, the, the presentation of the data had also, had, had to be also accounted for. And that maybe is not very important for NLP applications, but other information that we at first didn't deem important, such as the structural information, turned out to be important in the representation of the dictionary entry. Um, so the problems that we detected were mainly of four types. Um, we saw that with Antelex Lemon, the way it was at that time, we lost a structural information. Um, and this structural information had actually lexical information in it, but implicit. And I'm talking here about senses, embedding senses, 
or infer or sense ordered, so ordered senses, or groups of entries that are nested one inside another. So that's in stru structural information, but there is some lexical information also in that grouping and also in that embedding. There is lexical data that we were losing. Um, there was also a lack of elements for some annotations in the dictionary entry, but we detected especially a lack of guidelines on how to use ontolex lemon to represent lexicographic resources in general. So sometimes we did have the element in the linked data model, but we didn't know exactly how to use it to cover that information. And, and lastly, we had also some mit mismatches between Lexinfo and DTD and KD's conceptualization of the domain. So the, the model, this new module for, the, for lexicography that the Ontolex community have published, actually just last week, uh, and many people from the Ontolex community are here in, at ELEX this time. So the, the lexicog module had one general aim, which was to overcome the limitations of the linked data model of the de facto standard Ontolex to represent lexicographic information, but in a way that it does so respecting the lexicographic view with which this resource was originally conceived. So not imposing any kind of lexicographic um, structuring in the resulting data. And we did so, uh, well, the, the, the lexico, lexicog module does so by providing a new model of linguistic objects that respects the original structure and that separates what, was, uh, what, what is the lexicographic information from the purely lexical information. And I'll, and I'll show right now with the diagram. So in the bottom part, I have a cursor, yes. In the, in the, bottom, in the, in the bottom part, we have uh, the purely lexical layer with lexical entries and lexical senses. Um, and this is coming from the Ontolex core, except from two classes, uh, which I will not delve into now. But these two are purely lexical classes that aim to bear lexical information. But the lexical module um, extends this by providing structural aspects, structural classes, and elements that allow to, to point to, to elements that bear lexical information and that we can arrange the way we want. So if we want to have senses that embed other senses, we can represent the structure using lexicographic components. If we want to have entries that do not match the definition of lexical entry, we can still have a, lex a lexical entry that matches what we understand in our dictionary as entry. So how did we have, you have now an idea of our data, you have an idea of the model that we will be using our data with, and now uh, Doriel will, will give an overview of the methodology of applying this model to this data. So for the methodology, um, we decided to take an in incremental approach, which was basically breaking it down to smaller steps so that we could validate and make sure in each step that we're um, modeling correctly and everything is um, being counted for. Um, so the very first step was taking each path in the XML, um, extracting it from the DTD schema and with, from the XML files, and just mapping it to a corresponding element in Lexicog or Ontolex or Lexinfo. And based on that mapping, we developed a URI naming strategy for each element. And so after we have the mappings and the URI naming strategy, we start with taking, identifying just one or a group of entities to be modeled um, at the very first step, and um, basically by hand modeling them into triples and then taking that model that we've developed for the first step and applying it on, into the automatic uh, code. And after we have that, the next step would be to validate and should make sure that everything has been accounted for and um, there are actually two means that we use for validation. So the first one is the JSON schema, since the, basically the, sorry, the conversion is based on pre-existing conversion to JSON and it's in JSON-LD serialization, I might have not mentioned that. So um, we use JSON schema because it's native to JSON and it has a lot of advantages in terms of validation. Um, so the JSON schema, what it has basically 
in its structure, it allows us to check that the correct relations occur by checking that the correct elements of the JSON are nested where they should be. Um, they also check that all the necessary information is present with the required field, um, just says what has to be. Uh, it checks that only relevant information is present by um, marking additional items or additional properties to be false. And it can check that the URIs are well-defined with regular expressions. So I'll go ahead and show just like a part of the schema. And you can see that the pattern field has like an example for a regular expression and how it dictates how the URI should be um, with a regular expression. Um, and for the validation, that was the first part, is validating the structure with uh, the schema and then validating by uploading the results onto uh, triple store and querying it with Sparkle. So that's the methodology we followed. And now, what, how did we actually apply that model to the data? So I'm going to show an example of the kind of um, problems that we were facing. Um, so you, you have here a dictionary entry for, for arte, um, so art in, Sp in Spanish. It has a synonym which is embedded in the dictionary entry, inspiration. And it has, a, well, it has a sense. This is the first sense. That sense has an example here. Music, dance, and painting are uh, art expressions. Um, with, with translations of the example. And then you also have a compositional phrase or a multi-world expression at the bottom, which is, if you, if you realize, it's also embedded inside the dictionary entry. So um, I'm talking about embedding and things embedded inside other things, and you see why. Um, so the first problem that we face is that one thing is a lexical element and another thing is a dictionary entry. So we have a dictionary entry here, which is arte, and it has lexical items inside it. So we had to differentiate between a lexical entry, a dictionary entry, and a lexical entry. And that is something that the lexical module now allows to. So we, this is an extract in, of RDF, of the resource, uh, resource description framework, in Tartal. And in this way, we can say, I'm not going to go into much detail, but we can say we have a dictionary, which is a lexicographic resource, according to the lexical module, and it has an entry. And that entry, this entry, uh, describes a lexical unit, which is arte. Now, we can also have different lexical units, and one of those is fine arts, artes plasticas, the compound I showed earlier, and they all belong to a lexicon, to just a, a, a collection of lexical units. And in this way, I'm differentiating what is a dictionary entry, it's only this one, arte, from what, is, what are just lexical entries from the ontolex uh, background. Um, another example, talking about things embedded inside other things, is the, the, these three dictionary entries from the German dictionary, from K dictionaries. So, Besuchen, Visit, Besuch, Visit, and Besucher, um, Visitor. So, we have three, whoops, we have three dictionary entries that in the source data are embedded into a nested entry because they all share, they all share root. Um, and there was previously, there, there was no way in the ontolex model to capture that these three things are grouped together into a sort of a container. Um, now we can do so with the, with the lexicog module in the same way we had before. We have a dictionary. I'm not saying here is a dictionary. It was in the previous slide. And this lexicographic resource has three entries. So this would be besuchen, uh, besuchen, besuch, besucha. And now we can say, okay, there is a dictionary lexicographic component, sort of a container. This is aimed to represent that nested element. And it points to uh, the three different members, the three different dictionary entries that it, uh, that it gathered. And the last example goes back to the, the, to the examples that I show about art. And uh, if you recall, there was an example which has a, an example of a sense which has, which has translations. And the way of representing senses and translations, senses, their examples, and translations of those examples is, is fairly easy with the lexicog module. We can say we have a sense, this sense has an example, this huge uh, identifier is the example, and the example, which is of, kind of the type usage example, has this value, and it hit, if it has translations, it has 
just the appropriate translation in the other language. So the take-home message of all of this is um, it's just three points. With Lexicog, uh, we can address the loss of a structural and lexical information that we had earlier with, the, with only the Ontolex model. And it provides ways to account for the different annotations that we have in the lexicographic record. Also, with the validation and as regards the methodology that Dariel explained, an incremental approach together with the JSON schema, we, we learned that it's a solid first um, output that has to be later manually validated with queries in the Sparkle endpoint or just with someone checking that everything is okay as a previous step to linking to other resources. And of course, that previous step is uh, necessary for the future work, which would be to, to link um, the different multilingual course, so cross-lingual link of the different monolingual course of K dictionaries to the external resources in order to leverage all the potential of linked data technologies. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Oh, I this first. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. I have a question. Um, so, as far as I understood, Lexicog, um, uh, if Ontolex Lemon basically represents language, uh, Lexicog basically represents uh, the dictionary as it is in in uh, site. So, my question is, uh, how different will would be lexicog usage uh, if a dictionary would uh, would have been natively uh, built with ontolex lemon yeah okay so um, if a dictionary would have prob probably if a dictionary would have been uh, built from on ontolex lemon from scratch i doubt that we would want to make these lexicographic distinctions that we had that we are inheriting from the e-lexicography and paper lexicography. So probably my guess is that if we generate linked data native dictionaries, as, as we talked about in other, okay, in other occasions, I guess the lexicog module would, would be compatible with that, but I am not sure it would be called for and as required as in cases in which we are inheriting things from paper lexicography. So thank you very much for the, for the presentation. And uh, I'm referring to the talk you were giving this morning on getting into one dictionary from various, uh, and, and I think that this, this relation between lexicographic module and mm -hmm. the lexicon might be useful to have a kind of pivot and try to merge things instead of only linking. Exactly. So part of the... Um so when, we were, when we were motivating lexicog, um, we, can, we thought that a possible ex scenario would be to have a pool of lexical entries, like a, like, like a matrix uh, of lexical elements, and it, it depends on your audience. Of course, this is going back to the theories of functional lexicography, but depending on your audience or the target group of your dictionary, you, can, you may want to arrange things in a way or the other. So if you apply then the layer of the lexicog module, you can, on the same pool of lexical elements, you can arrange things. Whoops one way or another, depending on your audience or the, or the, or the resource, or the, the aim of the resource or how it will be used to. But, it, of course, it's related to an idea of one single pool of lexical data as arranged as desired with these elements, depending on the use that you're going to give to it. Thank you for your talk. Um, could you say a bit more about how the JSON schema validation works and why you chose that over something like Shackle? Uh, that question for the real? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, since the conversion is already based on pre-existing pre conversion to JSON, so that would be just taking a JSON that we already have of our dictionaries that are originally in XML and converting them to JSON-LD. So it was natural for us to use the JSON schema as we already use it for the JSON. And the, the, kind, the type of validation that it offers is more structural. I mean, the, the Sparkle querying, just 
you know, can provide you a wider picture and making specific queries and retrieving specific information, but the JSON schema sets uh, the groundworks for validating the structure because the way you can define it and to match the JSON document is that you can define what kind of uh, information is nested where. So you can determine exactly what kind of relations would occur and what kind of relations don't occur at all. And so you know that for sure you have the correct predicate relations happening. Also, you have the required fields that says what kind of uh, mm, fields you have to have inside, so you can't miss anything, and it has the additional items or additional properties field to be false, so you can't have anything in the document that's not supposed to be there. So it's making sure that everything that has to be there is there, and nothing that shouldn't be there isn't there. And with um, the regular expressions, it's just easy to validate that the URIs are proper because you check that the string is well-defined. So. It was easier for us to use something that we're already using, and we know for sure that validates the structure in advance, and then we can upload to the triple store something that we already know is validated as a prior step, if that answers. Um, I think, uh, well, I, I may well have misunderstood something, but we'll, we'll see. You said that linking the data makes it more discoverable, mm -hmm. but it's commercial data to begin with. It's commercial data. Is that the, correct? The what? It, it has a commercial value. It's not a commercial. Oh, okay. 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 So right. I'm wondering how how uh, is it more available to the public or to the academic community? No, of course. Of course. Uh, when when I was talking about the motivation of using linked data in the first place, I was talking. In terms of discovering, just by clicking on something, and then because this is linked, it points you to something else that it's linked to. Um, well, of, of course, that works perfectly well with open with open data. With commercial data, um, there is there are there is conditional access to to data. So, of course, you can have open open uh, sources that link to commercial data. But in order to access them, you may want to you know well contact the company or see how you do to access that. You cannot just go and access the data for free, always. But uh, just the, the fact that that points to this other data, and then it's up to you whether you want, how, how, what kind of access, on which conditions you want to access that. But you know that that is there, because there's something else pointing to it. If I can add something. Of course. Um, also, as you probably know, linked data is an effort that's most prominently used in academia right now. And I think the purpose for a lot of academics is to make it at the forefront of industry as well and to present it as something that would be useful for customers and not only as a theoretic thing. So I think that when you're taking a privately held company and you're having it adapt all these technologies that you're working on on a theoretical level and making it more accessible to the industry, you're setting this theory, this model at the forefront of technology and industry as something that should be accessible for everyone and not just within the closed sphere of academia. So I think this was something that was guiding us when we were developing it. Anybody else? If not, then let's thank the presenters again. Thank you.